Thank you. And it's, it's great to be back at, at DLD and um, great to be sitting here with Moises, who's one of, uh, I think, the deepest thinkers, the most challenging thinkers, as well as being someone who's been both sides of, of, the, of, the, of the fence and been an active member of a government, as well as uh, writing about politics. And we have 20 minutes now to really tackle what I think is probably the most urgent question of our time. And I just wanted to start by saying you, I was reading an article that you've just written, and it has um, some statistics in it that really brought home what I think we sort of know, but when you see it starkly in data, you know, we really understand it. But if you wanted to find a thing that had changed dramatically in the world over the past 10 years, um, 10 years ago, two out of five people in the planet lived in a fully functioning democracy, and another one person lived in a partially functioning de democracy. Today, it's only one in five live in a fully functioning democracy, and two in five in a partially functioning democracy. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going to start by saying, what is what's gone on? What's the, what's the big sweep? I mean, I'm thinking 10 years ago, I was here at DLD. I was interviewing Randy Zuckerberg about the Arab Spring. We weren't quite seeing that as a failure yet. We had people from WikiLeaks. It was all going to be an era of accountability and power to the people. You wrote a book around the same time, The End of Power. Now you've written a book, The Revenge of Power. So thank you very much. Um, one of the things that uh, the, the, the pandemic has shown us is that uh, ideas, concepts, institutions, business models that we thought were permanent turned out to be transitional. And ideas that were transitional that we thought were, you know, just for, for a while, you know, remote work. It was going to be just until we dealt with the pandemic and then we all go back to our cubicles. Well, it, 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 does, it didn't happen that way. And uh, institutions that we thought were permanent, untouchable, immovable, and secure proved to be fragile. Think about US democracy. And uh, think about. Uh, all, all other uh, things, things that have shifted in, in, in recent years. One of the things that has changed is democracy and the support for democracy and uh, democracy is under threat. And it's under threat from a very stealthy perspective because the, 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 last, the, the past decade has seen the uh, ascent of leaders that, uh, and a style of doing politics that I, in the book I call the three P's. Populism, polarization, and post-truth. You combine these three things, and you get uh, a, a, a perspective on the ascent of people from Thailand to Hungary to Italy to Donald Trump to uh, a lot of uh, Latin American leaders and so on. Um, these are three things that have always been with us. Populism is not new, and polarization is not new, and, and surely uh, we have a long history of propaganda, except that post-truth is, is propaganda uh, plus, because propaganda used to be used by governments. Post-truth is done by all of us uh, that have access to Twitter and to social media and all that, and creates a reality where we don't know what's true and what's not, and who to believe, who to call, who to ignore. It is in this context and th that they do a lot of uh, presenting and posturing as Democrats, where in fact they are all representing autocratic projects, projects that limit the checks and balances that characterize a democracy. Uh, that uh, the limits, uh, for example, term limits. What we have seen is leaders that get to power through more or less uh, uh, valid elections, but the moment they get in power, they start undermining, undermining democracy by limiting, uh, you know, weakening the controls, the lim the, the, uh, uh, again, uh, checks and balances. But term limits is their first goal. And very often they do it through a constitutional change. They de denounce the past as unacceptable, uh, and, and, they, and therefore a constitutional change is needed. We need to change the constitution to deal with the problems we have. But in fact, it is just a trick to eliminate term limits and allow them to stay uh, in power. Uh, and we have seen one of the, 
very interesting experiences in, uh, with this new book is I go around the world talking about it and people felt that it was that it had happened to them but that it was exceptional that it was only happening to their country but the reality is that even though the, you, there are specific specificities and different things in different countries uh, the, the trend is a global trend and so the democracy is under attack it is not clear that in the long term unless we recognize it as a problem and act on it is going to be very hard to defend it. No problem has ever been solved if it was not detected, identified, and, and specified before. That is what is happening now. Uh, the attack on democracy is not something you would, if I ask you what are the 10 things that happened in the last decade that changed the world, you will have the list that goes from the pandemic to the financial crisis to innovations in technology, social media. All, we have all of that. Very few people would include the demise of democracy as something uh, that is a threat uh, looming. And, uh, and so we need to make more clear. We have to, to work uh, to clarify that this is a threat that needs attention. Yeah, and your book has been getting great reviews. I was just reading a, a long New Yorker piece about it. And I mean, one of the points they make was that so many of these populists are actually creations of the media entertainment industry. They're literally clowns or entertainers, and from Trump, I guess, to Berlusconi, Berlusconi Trump, was the model originally. Uh, and yet there is this incredibly consistent, serious set of tools that they use to, to, to drive um, democracy uh, into, a, into a weaker and weaker position, put it into a corner. So. I guess the thing that hasn't always been with us, you know, we have the three Ps, is this sort of post-truth driven by technology, I guess. Uh, so how, how much of the blame do you, do you put on technology and the tech industry for this? You don't, you, you know, social media and the platforms are, are technologies are tools. Uh, you never blame the tool. Uh, all tools are, you know, two edge, all, all innovations, all scientific progress. Uh, has, uh, you know, is a double-edged sword. You know, the internet is great, but it also has its downside, and so the same with social media. So rather than blaming the tools, uh, we need to identify who is, owns the tools and what are they doing with it. Uh, and, and, and there, of course, there is a lot of responsibility. You know, the whole infrastructure of our elections. You know, a democracy without elections is not a democracy. And uh, we now have a situation where our elections are contested everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and that, in theory, should be a problem that uh, should have been tackled and solved by uh, the people in technology. It you, you know, should not be that difficult to make sure that elections are fair, verifiable, transparent, and, 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 uh, and, and real. Uh, one of the things that happened with all these uh, uh, three P leaders, the leaders that use populism, popularization, and post-truth, is that they go out of their way to present themselves as Democrats. It's very important for them to have the, good, uh, the seal of good housekeeping of being a Democrat. And uh, for the world, they behave as Democrats. In practice, they are autocrats. So you ask yourself, why, why does you know, Saddam Hussein and Vladimir Putin and Hugo Chavez in my country, Venezuela, why did they have as elections? Everybody knows that the elections are scammed, <clears throat> that they are going to win the elections with 97% of the vote. Uh, that, uh, you know, but why do they go into these institutional contortions and, and, and theater? Uh, electoral theater, why don't you, they do like the old time dictators that said, you know, I'm the, the boss here and I have the guys with the guns ready to shoot in defense of my regime. Why? Well, and the, the, the explanation of this appetite for, uh, uh, for democracy is legitimacy. They need the legitimacy that elections, even scam elections provide a little bit of, democ of, of legitimacy that they uh, desperate for. And partly, I think one lesson is we have to get away from thinking of democracy as about voting and it's about so much more than that, I guess. Yeah, that's one of the first changes is convey and, and try to explain to people that, you know, just uh, talking about politics and then showing or not showing up in elections, it doesn't buy you a democracy. Democracy needs more work than that. So if we look into the, the next few years I mean, and take the biggest democracy in the world, India, and we take the most influential democracy in the world, the United States, 
how are you currently seeing these trends play out there? I mean, do you, th do you think Trump's back in and America well, look, ceases uh, to be maybe, a fully functioning yeah. democracy? Does India really go off the rails under Modi? Both are, are using the three Ps. Both, are, both Trump and Modi are three P leaders, and there are plenty of examples, and we don't have the time, but there, I can go on for uh, hours on the list of the ways in which they behave that are representative of that. But if you look at what is Trump and Trump people doing, uh, it reflects it. They are trying, they have effectively gained control of the state uh, entities. Uh, each state has a, a structure, has a Senate, has a, and, and there, is, uh, um, there are public functionaries that are in charge of elections in that state. And they have been taking over those states and those uh, individuals and place their own trusted people. Those are the people that are going to be calling and say who won the election. The people that count the votes and get the results, they are controlling that. So they are in controlling the infrastructure of elections. Uh, and that then <clears throat> creates all sorts of dynamics about who says what and, who, and who's to blame. And, you know, let's see what happens and who calls the elections the next time in the United States. What about India? In India, you have seen uh, the, polar the polarization in India is very profound because it has very strong racial undertones. And, uh, and uh, there are regional di differences. So people develop identities, uh, a smaller, more tribal-like uh, identities are more important than ideological postures. And that is every, we've seen that everywhere in India is very pronounced in terms of how Modi is using race and religion uh, to, to divide. And polarization is, is like, it's like cholesterol. You have good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So you have good polarization, which is essentially democracy, and you have bad uh, uh, polarization, which is uh, the kind of device, divisiveness situation in the nation, which people cannot tolerate that the other cannot coexist with the other, and then that they, that in the, we see it in the United States. You know, it's paralyzing. It's very hard to make decisions. It's very hard to find convergence, agreement on very fundamental things, are elusive because of this hatred, hatred between people that simply or com in, in complex ways, have different views about uh, political life. And it's interesting, as I look at America, you see some of the titans of Silicon Valley coming in. I mean, you have Peter Thiel on the sort of libertarian right, funding a lot of, of action, uh, both in Washington and around the country. You see Reid Hoffman. So it's two, two key members of the PayPal mafia, really Reid funding a lot of protecting democracy activity. Um, you know, what, what should the tech sector be doing, given it's often perhaps rightly getting a fair amount of blame for well, it, having it, contributed to this problem in the first place? Bystanding is dead. They cannot be bystanders in, in all of these uh, situations. It's a, it's a luxury that we cannot afford. Uh, I don't want them to, to abandon their right to support a candidate or an ideology. I do want them to abandon the notion that they are just bystanders, that they're just allowing free expressions to thrive. I think we need, I am a, a freedom of speech fundamentalist, uh, but there, are, uh, there should be limits to, uh, uh, to what happens, and, uh, and I think that the tech sector in general has to so you would more. be with Elon Musk in wanting Trump back on Twitter and so forth? No, but in the same way that I would not be in favor of somebody in this room yelling fire, fire, and uh, when it's not, it's the whole example of, mm. it's the whole example of freedom of expression. Is the freedom of, is, is somebody here has the, the right to start saying that there's a fire that we all should run out of the room? Is that healthy? decent. Uh, uh, is that something you want? No, and that shows you and illustrates the very thorny problem between uh, extreme uh, freedom of expression and, uh, uh, and, and highly controlled censorship. We don't want any of the two. So we're sitting here at a moment where you know, Putin has invaded a democratic nation, perhaps, I mean, certainly I've heard Bill Clinton say that he thinks Putin is driven by a hatred of democracy and, and Ukraine was a 
one of the reasons he's moved in was to stop the democracy in, in Ukraine ever having a chance of succeeding. You've written you know, that, that you think this may be the wake-up call the West needs to actually stand up for democracy. Can you just talk a bit more about that? And yeah. I guess in Germany there was an initial amazing change in, in direction from the Chancellor, but now do the, do the actions match the words? And I guess that's going to be a big question if this war in Ukraine continues. So the tragedy has, is a tragedy, and the Ukrainian and the, the invasion is a tragedy and unacceptable and so on, but it has some silver linings. One is that uh, Putin has done wonders to, uh, for the brand for democracy. Uh, and uh, Putin has given such a bad name to the kind of regime that he ru runs that, that that's good news. The other good news is that uh, the crisis and the war uh, allowed uh, Europe to discover that they are a superpower they, without realizing it. They are a superpower, except that they did not act as one. Uh, and that required unity and, uh, uh, and a shared, uh, and the capacity. So we were all surprised, starting by Putin, at the speed with which Europe reacted and shed all kinds of ideas, institutions, ways of doing things that were slow, cowardly, careful, bureaucratic. And all of a sudden, here's Europe making decisions that you know, would have been in, in, in unimaginable uh, three weeks or a few weeks before the, the election. Germany deciding to, you know, to, to contribute to jump to 2% of GDP in, in military spending. 2% of GDP of the third largest economy in the world is a lot of money. And if you sustain it for a while, then Germany will have some of the most powerful military forces in the world. That is an idea that was, again, unimaginable. Uh, Switzerland uh, decides to abandon neutrality. You know, that's another surprise and thing of things that one thought were permanent and proved to be transient and vice versa. Um, so all of this is in flow now. We are in the midst of, of it. We don't know how sustainable it is. We don't know if the unity that allowed Europe uh, to be a player, a very important uh, player, and play with the superpowers. We don't know if that's going to hold. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be division, as you said, in Germany that started with a very enthusiastic anti-Putin reaction. Uh, now uh, uh, is, you know, they are thinking again. But uh, they have already moved in directions that were uh, forbidding in the past. So we're almost out of time. And I, I, I want to recommend again that people buy your book and read it, because I think it's really powerful. But in this room, lots of people are doing interesting, world-changing work in their tech activities and their other activities, hopefully all committed to democracy, because we still think that's the best system. Um, what, should we, what can we do now to fight back against these trends that are out there? Recover, <coughs> recover the per, your peripheral vision. In order to be successful in the, in the tech business, you have to be highly specialized, obsessive, uh, driven, uh, and just look at the specifics of your sector, your technology, your partners, your clients. And, and, and that can be, um, that is indispensable. You have to have that. But that very often erodes your capacity to look around you, the peripheral vision. And what we have discovered, and some tech companies have discovered, is that the main threats and opportunities come from places that they did not imagine. Well, the same is happening with democracy. It, it's very important to pay attention and pay uh, uh, and understand what are the peripheral forces, some, most of them invisible at this point, that require uh, attention and reaction. OK, well, the gong has sounded. Um, <laughs> I think this is a subject that probably merits more than 20 minutes. But anyway, our time is up. It's uh, incredibly, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Can the three Ps be used to strengthen democracy? And if so, so sorry? Can the three Ps be used to strengthen democracy? And if the answer is yes, should they be used to strengthen democracy? No, well, I, as I said, the three Ps are po populism, and that has.
dimension of its own. Polarization, as I said, there is a good and a bad one. So yes, if it strengthens, the good one, if it strengthens democracy, which is democratic and profoundly so, then yes. And post-truth uh, needs to be rethought. Uh, and uh, the anarchic nature that it now has needs to be curbed. Thank you.